Okay, let's pick up where we left off last time. And I was answering questions that people had. Where we left off last time is we were discussing functions. So what I'd like to do is sort of wrap that up, kind of remember where we were, and then go back and finish that up. And then I received via email some other questions, and I can see if you have other questions beyond that. We talked about functions, and it's important to understand functions. If after this discussion you still have a problem with them, then we should talk in lab to clarify them even further. Because these are they're, they're a fundamental part of really any kind of programming, whether it be C sharp or Java. These aren't this is not something that's like new or distinct to Java. So last time I think we did another example and we had a room example. And the idea was that we were going to write a we're going to write a function that would define a room. And then we would ask the function if we had so many square foot of carpet, would it be enough to cover the room? Okay, so here's our class. Our class has two attributes, length and width. They're both doubles. We have one constructor and one constructor only. Um, the reason I did this is because it really doesn't make any sense to talk about a room that doesn't have any dimensions. So I define a constructor, and I define it to accept the length and the width. Now, in addition to that, we would also need the sets and gets in case we wanted to get the width, set the width. So we might as well add those in here now. Public void set length. This allows us to call a method to give the length of this room a value. That's what a set method does. We do this even though we have a constructor to set them, simply because we want to make this class as flexible as possible. Keep in mind again that some of this will make more sense if you consider this as being connected to a user interface where maybe we can give the, the room an initial length and width and then we can later on change it if we find that there was a problem in it, if we set it wrong. So set methods don't return anything, so void. They accept an argument. That argument is given to the value of one of the attributes. So we make the length equal whatever argument was passed in here. Same thing with the width. Now the get methods are like that, except they're not to set a value, they're to return the value. So they return a double. We have our method here. There are no arguments. We're simply returning the value of the length. And the return statement looks like this, return length. And we do the same thing for the width. It's important to know the different parts of a function. Let's look at this function. Public indicates that it can be used outside of this class. So other classes can call this method. If we define a class as private, I'm sorry, if we define a method as private, then the method could only be called inside of this class. A lot of times we're going to make the methods public because we're creating them so other 
applications and other programs and other pieces of code can call these methods. So that's what public means. Boolean is the, the type of data is going to return. All right? So the type of data is going to return. In Java, it's a strongly typed language, which means we give a type for everything. We give a type for a variable. We give a type for arguments. We give a type for returned values. And in this case, what we are going to return from this function is a Boolean. A Boolean is simply a primitive that holds either a true or a false. Is enough carpet is the name of the function. It's a function that lives in the room class. All right. We could call that function on any room object we create. All right. Remember, we create a class which is a template for the individual objects, which are instances of that template. So this defines everything that we are interested in about rooms. We can then write in our code the creation of specific rooms and ask them questions. Finally, we have the type of variable that is the argument. It's a double. And a square root. Arg square root is the name of the argument. All right. And we then look to see if the square feet is enough to carpet the room. In other words, is the square feet that we're passing to this function greater than or equal to the calculated area. If it is, we return true. Otherwise, we return false. Questions about this so far? Now, let's see how we are going to use this function. Because we saved it, I'm going to create a unit test. Remember, and I think still people still have a little bit of confusion about the unit tests because they see hard coding and they think, oh, hard coding is bad. They've heard that in other programming classes. And all that's true. But keep in mind the purpose of this code. This is not code that we're interested in reusing. This is code we are writing simply to test our class. If you can imagine, we might have this room class as part of an application for our carpeting store that does all sorts of things. All right? And we might have a user interface for that where you enter in the values of how big the room is and you pick what kind of carpeting you want and you do this and you do that and so on. And we'll call different methods on these. All right? But in order to prove that this class works by itself, isolated from everything else, we're going to write a simple set of test code. And that test code exists only to test to make sure that this room class does what it's supposed to do. All right, demonstrates that this class works. In other words, we don't, or we're not really worried about this code being elegant. All right, if we do something that is the long way of doing it, doesn't matter. This is not really part of the real application. This is more or less throwaway code. We're going to keep it in case we need to retest it, but we're not worried about this being reusable. This has one specific purpose in time. And we're going to do it, and we'll be done with it. So let me make my class, class unit test. Now, in our application, we have one class that has the public static void main method that accepts string array as an argument and then does its thing. So this is a class run. It gets the ball rolling and uses our other class. class in this case, is going to use the room class to test it and make sure it works. So let's do it. Can I ask Absolutely. Is unit test a required name no. that I tried to uh, I had a unit test and I tried another name and it gave me an error message. Well, it, it, didn't, give you a, it didn't give you an error message because there was another okay. different name. Okay. We can call this, you know, room class test oh, okay. or whatever. Okay. 
So what are we going to do here? We're going to create an instance of that room class. The room class is a template. We're going to create a specific room. So I'm going to say room r equals new room. Now, we only have one constructor on this, right? When we say equals new room, we're calling the constructor. The constructor we have ex expects two doubles, a double for the length and a double for the width. So I'll put in there that it is a six, uh, 16 or 20 by 16 room. All right. Now, let's say a certain amount of carpet. Let's say I have 4,000 square feet of carpet. All right. I'm going to ask the room, hey, is that carpet to carpet this room? So if I say if... R dot is enough carpet. I'm going to give it the amount of carpet. If this is true, then system dot out dot print ln. is enough to carpet room. Otherwise, is not enough to carpet the room. So let's look at this in detail. R is carpet enough amount of carpet. A couple things about that. Notice that we have to say R dot is carpet enough. We can call the function is carpet enough on a room object, right? So whatever we, however we call it, we have to call that function on a room object, which is a room object that we've created up here, named R. So that's going to call this function. Now, this function returns a Boolean and accepts as an argument a double. So we are supplying it a double. All right? So we're giving it what it needs. Does it matter? this is called amount of carpet and the function is looking for arg square foot. No. Doesn't matter if we have different names for the argument for how we're using it. It's strictly by position. In this case we only have one argument so it's easy. It's going to take whatever value of this variable is and plug it into this variable name. If we add two arguments, for example, it would take the first value and plug it into the first argument, the second value and put it into the second argument. So it's based strictly on position. All right. Now the arguments have to match the type that we've declared the function at. All right. So really, I don't have two arguments. I only have one argument. So I'm going to change this only to accept one argument. And I have to make sure when we call the function, we only give one argument. 
So there's two pieces of a function. There's actually creating the function and there's using the function. When we create the function, we create it accepting an argument. An argument is additional information the function needs to do its job. I can't say, is there enough carpet in this room? Is there enough carp is, there, is this enough carpet to carpet this room? Is a 20 by 20 room. Is there enough? Well, I don't know. How much carpet are you talking about? Are you talking about 100 square feet? Or 1,000 square feet? Or 10,000 square feet? All right? You have to supply an additional piece of information for this function to work. It's not enough just to know the length and width of the room. All right? I have to ask it, gee, this is how much carpet I have. Is that enough to carpet this room? And again, if this was in an application, maybe I have a certain kind of carpet and inventory, certain square footage. I might click, this is, for this carpet, is that enough for the room? And it would take the square foot, call the function, and get the result. So things are based entirely by position. And the, the function's arguments have to match how it's being called. We did talk about function overloading, where you can have different functions with different number and types of arguments. And that's OK. We don't have that in this example. Just know that if you do that, whatever argument we call it with has to match one of the function definitions. All right? Can't match more than one. OK. Now, this function. returns a Boolean. So normally, we would see something like in our if statement, does is equal something? Or is this greater than something? Or is this less than something? And this, does this equal true? All right? But since this is already a Boolean, that is, this is already a variable or a, 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 a thing that only has two possible values, true or false. I can just say, is this Boolean true or false? If it's true, then I print out the message saying that, yes, there's enough carpet to carpet the room. Otherwise, I can print saying, no, there is not enough carpet. So let me save this and compile it and make sure that everything is OK. I'll go and save that. I'll go into the PowerShell. What's the folder name? Example for 9.17. So I'm in the room folder with my two room classes. I'm going to make that a little bit smaller because that's a little too big. So I'll clear screen. And there's my classes. And I can compile room class test.java. Java C, thank you. Clean compile. What do you know? Now I can run it. Oops. 
I remember the name. Room class test. That's why I always call it unit test, right? Java room class test. Four, 4,000 is enough to carpet room. Let's make sure, let's verify that that's right, right? We made a room that was 20 by 16, that is 3,200 square feet. Yeah, 4,000 square feet of carpet would be enough to carpet that room. Let's make it 20 by 32. That'll be 6,400 square feet. It should tell me. And what I'm going to do, actually, is I'm going to practice what I preach. I'm going to write... 20 times 16, 3,200, I think. Oh, 320, you're right. I was worried I was hallucinating. <laughs> no, I must be. All right. So we'll do that, and it will do 400. It should still end up right should still end up saying that four hundred is enough to carpet room. Thirty two hundred. Um, yeah. Uh, just about every example I've done in classes is, is available on Canvas. Now let's say we have, instead, we have a another room that is, oh, let's say 20 by 25. That would be 500 square feet. So this room, it should tell me that the amount of carpet is not enough, right? Because we're trying to carpet 400 or 500 square feet with 400 square feet of carpet. So we compile and run it. My messages are not Good, I probably should say is enough to carpet room one, room two, but you get the idea. The first one shows that it's able to, the second one isn't. I have a good measure to test this thoroughly. Test one where it's right exactly on the mark. So I'm going to do a 20 by 20 room. The 20 by 20 room, yeah, theoretically that's enough, right? You better get it exactly perfect, though, and not have any extra, or, or not, not use any extra, you know, or waste any, as I guess is what I want to say. And it tells me 400 is enough for carpet one, for room one. 400 is not enough for carpet two. 400 is enough for room three. So I tested all of the possibilities, right? I tested low, high, and right on the edge. All right? So I would say three test cases is probably what I would need for this. All right? Um, I might do more. I might change the values and all that. but. I don't care that this doesn't look like good code, that this is not reusable, because its only purpose is to test this guy. 
this guy is the guy that's going to be put in production. All right. Questions about the functions that I have here. The key things to remember, all right, first of all, remember that we can only call that function called is enough carpet on a room object. That's where the function lives, on the room class. So we create a room object, and we can call that function on a room object. So that's why we need r dot is enough carpet. We have to call it on a specific room object. Yes? So um, this, might, this might be a stupid question, but um, how does Java know what you're talking about when you're calling a function that's from a separate file like that? You're, cause you're, there's no include statement or anything. That, uh, good, good question. How does, how does Java know what a room is, essentially? Mm -hmm. And in our case, and in the simplest scenario, they're both in the same folder. Okay. So Java can recognize, uh, a class can recognize all the classes in the same folder. Okay. So. It does that automatically. It does that automatically, right. In other words, room is declared in the same folder, wherever that folder is, yeah. The room class is declared in the same folder there, so it can find it. Okay. If you can't, if it's not, then you use the import to specify. Like, for example, an array list. We have to import the package for the array list to tell it to know what an array list is. Okay. All right? Other questions about this? All right. Again, if you're still having questions about functions, that's cool, just talk to me. I got some other questions emailed to me. One of them is, I don't understand what this following statement is, and we'll pull it up in the pizza example. Can someone explain what that instruction does? I understand what the function does, I think. Okay. Uh, in that it loops through <laughs> the array that you defined above a list of pizzas, and it's going to match the index value of that list to what that is to get that item. Okay. But what is the syntax of how the dot get i is what I've not ever seen that before. Normally if you're doing a dot it precedes something. This dot is after the array. Is that dot get just how you do this or how? how well I so that you've never seen a dot after something before, because even in C sharp, right? Well, that's true. Size and length, I have, but I've never seen a get after. Okay. Well. Get is just a method. Get is a method, right? So let, let's let's look and analyze this, because to to break down the syntax, list of pizzas. Okay. What is list of pizzas? It is defined up here as an array list. So list of pizzas is an array list object, all right? How can we tell that this is a method? Because that is a method. Get is a method. How do, we, how, do you, how do you know that for sure, even if you've never heard of an array list before? The parentheses. So when you have an object dot something, if that something includes parentheses, it's a method. All right? If I had something like this, then that would be an attribute. But we don't, all right? Because we make all our attributes private, all right? But that means it's a method. Just like this is a method, 
right? List of pizzas. Again, that is an array list. What method are we calling? We're calling the method that returns the size of it. This is returning the member of that array list, the element of that array list. What does our array list contain? It's an array list of what? Pizzas, right? So the first element of the array list, if there is one, has an index of what? Zero. The second one has an index of what? One. Third one has an index of two, and so on. So i is our counter as we go through the loop. It's going to go from zero through almost the, list, the size of the array. All right? And that almost is because the index starts with zero. So for example, if we had three pizzas in our pizza list, all right, the number of those pizzas are zero, one, and two. And that trips, this is going to take through the loop. Zero, one, and two. We're adding the get, and in the parentheses is the argument of i. That i is going to be zero, one, and two, successively. What this does, in other words, is it returns the object in that position in the array list. Remember, a array list only contains objects. And what's more, our array list only contains a specific kind of object. It only contains pizzas. So what this will do is this will find the pizza in the pizzas in the array list, starting with the first, the first time through, the second, and the third. Okay? This is simply declaring a pointer to that, because we want to do something with it. So I'm creating a pizza pointer. All right? A pizza pointer is a variable that can point to a pizza. So I'm making that because I want to do something with that pizza. And I need a pointer to the object in order to do that. So this simply takes that pizza off the in it, it gra grabs a pointer to it on the array list and says, "Hey, the first pizza on the pizza list right now, call that p, so we can do something later on." And what we're doing later on, we're, well, we're getting the cost, so that we can add the cost to the running total. You can verify. Any object, the list of functions and uh, attributes and so on to it, just by like looking at a file called a Java doc. So if I do Java array list, probably the first thing on the list would be this, which is a documentation of the array list class. And this shows a bunch of things about it. And this is a little confusing to read. This is one of those things that, um, you know, it's a skill like anything else. You've got to practice it. And you go and look up the class definition. And this talks about a bunch of things, blah, 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 blah. And one of the things it talks about is as you go down the list, it shows you get is a method on it. It accepts an integer. And it returns the element at the specific position in the list. So get, sub z get with an argument of 0 returns the 0th element. 1 returns the element at position 1 to the element at position 2. And since we know that that element is pizzas, because that's how we defined our array list, we know that it's going to return a pizza. So we say get that element from the list. And then that element, by the way, what was its cost? A shorthand way to do this code would be this, by the way. Some people like this better, some people don't. I think it is a little more complicated, but you may like it. So you could replace both of these statements with this statement. OK. 
can sort of chain together functions. Couldn't you shorten or kind of like optimize the statement even more by just having cost plus equals list of pieces? You know what? Those kind of things, they compile to the same code. And if it's easier for you to read, that's fine. Otherwise, I wouldn't worry about it. Okay. I really don't think there's any efficiencies in terms of running. Could be wrong, but I really don't think so. Um, that's more for the benefit of the programmer, I think, than the benefit of the, the program running. I didn't know that they had compiled the same code. I'm pretty sure they would. Um, I just broke this pen. All right. Um, but yeah, these are the same. And all this does is it sort of chains together. This is getting the pizza, and then the pizza that gets returned, we're calling the calculate cost method on. So it's just a, it's a shorthand to do that. All right, here's a question. And this is a good question. How do I get access to the content of the pizza order? In other words, how could I see that there are three pizzas on the order? How could I see, how could I print a receipt? This isn't the exact question, but I'm kind of paraphrasing it a little bit. How could I print a receipt that says your order is for one large pepperoni, one large without pepperoni, and an extra large whatever? <laughs> how could I do that? Good question, right? You could. Where would I do that? Unit test code. Well, I couldn't because list of pizzas doesn't live there. So the question, let's see, let's bring up these other two things. I have my order here. I created it. Nowhere in there is to find the list of pizzas. Do I have a method on orders that returns the array list? No. I could write one. All right. Sort of the short answer to this question is you can't. All right. Now, that's the real short answer, right? You can't given the current state of these classes. So I would have to write additional code to, to create a receipt, for example. The question, though, is, is where does that code live? All right? And what, where I would put it, what do you, what does a, what does, what does a, a receipt, which object does that seem to be most associated with? The order. All right? So, I would create public string receipt. That prepare a receipt. All right. Now, oftentimes what is done is with a class, you add a two string method to your class. A two string method is a nice, concise explanation of what that object is. So for my pizza,
maybe that would be my two-string method. All right. And then maybe in my order, I would have something like this. Get each pizza in turn. Call the two string method. And then finally, I would say I could output some other things. I'm not going to output every single thing, but just to give an idea. Okay, let's see if this compiles. Tests I could say O dot print receipt. Java and order 118. Ah, I have that returning a string. I'll make that void. Okay. And here is the essentially the the listing of the receipt. 
This brings up a good point, and this is why I like this question. Because part of object-oriented programming is figuring out where stuff goes. All right? And one of the principles of object-oriented oriented program is encapsulation. The idea of encapsulation is like this. Everything about a certain class should live in that class. There shouldn't be code in a couple of places about the same thing. So, the code to print an order needs to live in the order class. It shouldn't live anywhere else. If it lives somewhere else, then you violated the rules of encapsulation. If, for example, we put that in the unit test class, then everything about an order wouldn't live in the order class. Some of it would live in the unit test class, some of it would live in the order class. And that's not good. The idea is, is that when we define a class, we define a component that can be used anywhere we need that component. So if we're writing, if we're creating a handheld application, a, a, a mobile application, that when someone uh, places an order, it prints up a receipt for them. Or we're creating a desktop application that someone at the point of sales at the pizza shop enters in an order. Everything about an order, all the code for it should live in that order class. All right? Every code about the pizza should live in the pizza class. And so on. The unit test in our case is just filling the role of the user interface. It's not doing any of the work. It's just calling the methods on the various classes that we've created to test them. All right. So it's, it's, it's good to, to ask that question of where it would go because you could do this a couple different ways. All right. But in the purpose of, uh, in the, in the, with considering encapsulation and considering that everything about an order should live in that order class, the best place to put this code would be to put it in the order class itself because it's about an order. All right? Um, it's not always easy to make that decision. In this case, I think it's pretty straightforward, but in other cases, you really have to consider what is that really part of? You know, where does that really belong? And in this case, it's pretty clear where that belongs. Other questions about what we have? All right. Monday, I'll see if you have any last questions before we go forward, because when we go forward, there's no looking back. All right. You can also ask me questions in lab, certainly. Uh, but next week, we're going to start inheritance, which is an important topic in all object-oriented development. So we'll start that next week after we clear up any final questions. All right, we'll see you in lab.